Well, good morning and welcome back to Cross Community Church. We're, we're really glad you're here, especially if you're here today and you are our guest. Um, it was said earlier, uh, but our mission as a church is to lead all people uh, to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And so what we're not going to do here this morning is to play church. Uh, we're, we're not here to gather large crowds. We're here to call you to follow Jesus more wholeheartedly, more passionately. <clears throat> now, the reason for that is because we believe that the fullest, richest, most satisfying life you could ever live is the life most fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. It's not a, a life with more money. <clears throat> it's not a life with more opportunity, more success. It's not a life getting to indulge in more of the things that your flesh longs for. The life that's going to be most satisfying, the fullest, richest, best life you could possibly live is a life lived in full surrender to Jesus Christ, walking in obedience to everything that he has commanded you. Now, if you were with us last week, you know we, t we celebrated the freedom from death that we have as a result of, the, of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, being buried and raised on the third day. What we know is that our Savior, he isn't dead. We're not trusting in someone who's still in a grave somewhere. Uh, we're not thinking, okay, yeah, he claimed to do these things, but then, you know, he died and it's all over. Instead, we trust in a Savior who died on the cross for our sins, who was buried and then rose on the third day, displayed himself, showed himself to more than 500 people. We today worship Jesus Christ. We sing these songs. We celebrate because we believe that Jesus Christ is alive. Like he's ruling and he's reigning in our world today. He's in control. He's in charge. We can sing Psalm 46 with joy and delight because we know that our God is in control. So we're not serving a God who's dead. We're serving a risen Savior. And we can now hope that just as Jesus rose victorious over the grave, what we can believe is that we're no longer dead in our trespasses and sins, but we have been made alive together with Christ, that this life is just like a blip on the radar of eternity, that we are going to have eternal life with Christ Jesus living in heaven forever. And so that's a joy. I mean, we look forward to that and we celebrate that. There will be a day where there's no more hurting and no more crying and no more pain. We get to see Jesus face to face. We know one another fully. There's no more relational issues, no more strife, no more fighting, no more art. Like heaven, it's going to be perfect. And we so look forward to that day that we get to see him face to face, be re reunited with our loved ones. But I want to tell you something. Wouldn't it be a tragedy if we waited until we breathed our last breath here on this earth to start living that abundant life? Wouldn't it be a tragedy if we thought, thought you know what, this life's just a blip on the radar. It's like the twinkling of an eye. The, you know, the, just as the dew vanishes very, rather quickly, this life's going to be gone. And we thought, so I'm just going to kind of hunker down and wait it out. Listen, that's not what God wants for us at all. What God wants is for us to begin living that abundant, that full, that rich life empowered by Him. He wants us to start living like heaven right here on earth. He wants us to begin to live out that life today. And as a result, like our light will begin to shine in the darkness as Jesus Christ exhibits Himself through us. We display His glory to a world who desperately needs the same hope that we found in Jesus Christ. Now, last week we talked about how the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus gave us freedom from death. This week I want to talk to you about how the death, burial, and resurrection gives us freedom from sin. Before you check out on me, because, I mean, who wants to deal with our sin, right? Like, this is kind of a, a, a heavy topic for many of us. And, and honestly, as I bring up the word, it might, like, kind of rouse feelings of shame within you or guilt or regret. Before we, we go there, I want to remind you that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of that, for your sin and for your guilt and for your shame. It has been atoned for. If you have come to faith in Christ, your sins have been taken away. That's not, that those aren't yours any longer. That doesn't define you any longer. Like we have been forgiven all of it. However, every single day we live, 
We have an opportunity to walk in either the power of the Holy Spirit or in the weakness of our flesh. So I, I want to define sin for you before we get too far into this, because it's been defined various ways. You might have heard it uh, in our modern day culture. It's been redefined or really it's been kind of watered down, right? That's not really sin. Uh, that's not, you know, so there's a lot of dispute here. So I want to be just really clear to you what sin is. Um, God is the perfect standard of righteousness, perfect in all of his ways, perfectly holy uh, in everything, perfectly just. To sin is to fall short of that glory, of that standard of righteousness. Now, you, you might have heard, it's like the, the archery term where, you know, the archer, he's aiming at a target and, you know, you got the, the bullseye and then the, the rings kind of, and you get more points the closer you get to the middle. Um, when we think about sin, you and I are not like, oh, we missed the mark a little bit, like we didn't hit the bullseye. When we think about our sin, we didn't hit the target. We're nowhere close. When you look at the perfection of God, all of us have sinned and fall short, like really short of the glory of God. So... Don't let that be discouraging to you, because when we think about our sin today, we're no longer walking in the weakness of our flesh. If you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, you have now been indwelled or empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a new life in Him. And so um, don't get discouraged thinking, I I've fallen so short, I'll never get there. What we should pursue is the perfect life that Jesus lived by the power of the Holy Spirit now at work in us. Okay, so sin, it's missing the mark, it's rebellion against God, it's falling short of His standard. Now, again, you might be tempted to check out at this point because uh, you're like, oh gosh, one of those sermons, we're going to get beat up a little bit. My hope is not to beat you up, but rather to build you up today. So I want to begin by talking about two profound misunderstandings when it c comes to sin and how important it is in our life. So uh, misunderstanding one, or the, the error that comes uh, as a result of thinking about sin in our culture, and this may be the most tempting error, although I don't know it's the worst. Um, this error is underestimating the destructiveness of sin. Everybody sins, right? We all make mistakes. We all sin, fall short of the glory of God. We're going to sin like I'm weak, I'm flawed, I'm going to make mistakes. So what's the big deal, right? This is our tendency in, in modern culture. Like, hey, my sin, it really doesn't matter all that much. There are things that I do in secret that nobody sees. It's the little white lie that it, it doesn't affect anyone else. It's just my own stuff. No one has to know. What they don't know won't hurt them. We make all sorts of excuses to minimize how destructive sin really is in our lives. Just to give you an example, if you remember Genesis chapter 3, God had created the Garden of Eden, and it was perfect. Like, Adam and Eve were married, and they didn't fight, y'all. I mean, it was perfect, right? This was unbelievable. Like, what God had done in this perfect garden, there was no sin, no suffering, no pain in the garden. Everything was perfect. They walked and talked with God face to face. They heard his voice audibly, saw him with their eyes. They have it made. And then comes the deceiver, the serpent. And he comes to Eve, and he wants to, well, he wants to deceive her. He wants to trick her into sinning. He said, did God really tell you you can't eat from any of these trees? And Eve says, no, no, that's not what he said at all. God said, don't eat from the, the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, uh, and we're not supposed to touch it either, which wasn't even true, but she, she told the enemy that. Well, what will happen? Well, if we eat or touch, then we're going to die. You know what the serpent said, the deceiver said to her? Surely you won't die. You eat a piece of fruit, you're going to die? Really? It won't be that big of a deal. I mean, how bad could it hurt? It's a piece of fruit. You eat fruit from all of these trees. Why would it matter if you ate the fruit of this one? And it's the same deception that the enemy brings into our lives. Hey, it's just a little sin. It's just a little lie. What could it hurt? What's the big deal about one small sin? just your thought life. Hey, you just needed to vent. Everybody gets angry sometimes, and we justify and we minimize the destruction that is ultimately caused by our own sin. And it's not just the ones that we consider to be great big. It's those little sins. We're like, hey, it's not a big deal, but they're profoundly destructive. This is the argument that we make over and over to ourselves. 
in our workplace, in our home. It's not that big of a deal. It's the lie that we buy into and brings destruction rather than living the abundant life we could have in Christ. And we walk this path of destruction for ourselves and everyone who's ultimately around us. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way which seems right to a person. Isn't this like kind of the way that works in our culture? Right? Isn't this what our, our culture is pushing on us? Like, you do you. Do what feels good. You, like, you get to have your own truth. You get to pursue your own happiness. Like, just do what ultimately feels good to you. The enemy's like, yeah, yeah, what would it hurt? There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to destruction. Galatians, the apostle Paul writing to the church in Galatia, he says it with a little more forcefulness. He says, do not be deceived. And we want to hear that here in 2021, just as, as powerfully as they would have heard it way back when Paul wrote the letter. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, this he will also reap. The one who sows to his own flesh, you do, you pursue your own ends, like you go and do what makes you happy. The one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. Now, this beginning announcement, don't be deceived. God won't be mocked. If you sow to please your flesh, you're going to reap destruction. But if you sow to please the Spirit from that, you're going to ultimately reap eternal life. And so for you, I would just want you to, to take a moment and to think about your life and to think about your sin and maybe that thing that you're tempted to. Like every one of us have these things that tend to draw us, maybe some areas of weakness in our life, areas where we might think, my sin's not that big of a deal. And would you just hear the word of God spoken into the midst of that? Don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. What you sow, you're ultimately going to reap. And for many of us, without even realizing it, because we bought into this lie that our sin isn't that big of a deal, like we're going about our, our every single day, and we're like just sowing seeds of destruction. Man, into our own lives, just a few seeds of destruction. Those aren't a big deal. They won't grow up and bear fruit of destruction. No, no, no. It's no big deal, right? And we just keep sowing those seeds, and we do it into our, the lives of our children. We do it into our marriage, just, just spreading a little seed. No big deal. We do it in our workplace. We do it into our friendships. We buy this lie that our sin, ah, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that destructive. There's a story I heard several years ago. Um, I was at a conference, and I heard a pastor. He, he talked about he was studying at home one day, and his young son was doing the deal that kids do. Uh, Dad, would you, come, would you come outside and play with me? You know, let's play ball, whatever. And he's like, hey, I can't play ball today. I'm sorry. I've got to get this studying done. And his son keeps badgering him because, you know, that's what kids do when they want to get their way. And he continues to press his dad and press his dad. And finally his dad said, listen, you've got to go outside and play. Like, I've got to get my work done. And then the eerie silence happened when your kids quit badgering you. Somehow it really irritates you when they do it, but then you're super concerned when it suddenly goes silent. And so it gets quiet in his house. The next thing he knows, he hears the front door slam, and his, his son comes running in. He says, Dad, my friend, my friend. And he looks, and here's his father. Uh, he sees his son with joy on his face. He's just delighted because he's found someone to play with. The only problem was that thing that he was playing with was actually a snake. And upon closer inspection, his son had picked up a baby rattlesnake and was carrying it in his, friend, in his hand saying, My friend! My friend! Now, for many of us who have any like understanding of wildlife or anything on it, what you know is that young boy was in profound danger. What you and I know was he he was this close to death and an incredible amount of pain. The father recognizes this and has to coach his son through putting the thing down, but it was in his house and it was kind of a, a dilemma for everyone. But for us, for many of us, we're like that immature little boy. We never grow up as believers looking into the word to see what's right and what is good versus what is destructive. And we go through our life carrying around our little friends thinking this isn't that big of a deal. We don't see the danger and the destructiveness that the enemy wants to bring into our homes and our families. So today I hope that you will see that sin always leads to destruction. And we've been made alive with Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit of God in us. We have the opportunity to walk the, uh, the path that leads to this abundant and full life for us. So we've got to stop underestimating 
the destructiveness of sin. The second thing that people tend to believe or tend to fall into, the mistake we make regarding sin, is that we underestimate the nature and the character of God. Many of us think about God the way we thought about our parents when we were teenagers. Old, out of touch, doesn't really understand how the world works today. Like they don't get it. And we think about God the same way. And God doesn't understand 2021. And God doesn't understand how the world works today. And so rather than obeying God, we walk in sin. Did God really say that we're not supposed to? Ah, I'm not sure that's what he meant. The other accusation of the serpent in the Garden of Eve. Is that really what God meant? Is it really sin? Is it really wrong? And what we're neglecting here is to recognize the God who's given us his word ultimately wants to lead us into life. Jesus said it in John 10.10. The enemy has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. If you'll remember the God who's given us his word, who, who's, who's given us this path, the word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our, our path. The God who did that is the God who, who created the world. Like he knows it all. Like he, he spoke it all into existence. Like you take this, the, the complexity of the world and the beauty of all that we see. God did that with his words. He knows. He's all knowing. He's all powerful. And God is all good. Like in every single way, God is love. Listen, the God who gave us the scriptures is the God who sent his son Jesus Christ to die that we might have life. God loves you. He is love. He can do no other. And every command that you find in the scriptures, every way that God would lead us to love our enemy, even when that's really tough, and love our, our neighbor, we don't want to do that. When God says, hey, don't let impurity come out of your mouth, but instead think on the things that are good. God, who has given us his word, every single command is really just an invitation to life. Like, come and experience fullness. Come and experience the abundance that I have for you. Like, the Bible is not, you know, an, an uptight parent, right, trying to keep us from enjoying and having fun. The Bible, instead, is an invitation into fullness of life. The richest, fullest, best possible life you will ever live is a life most fully surrendered to Jesus Christ and his word. But we often buy the lie. That God is somehow less than he is. That God isn't the God who's sovereign over all. Who's perfect in every way. Perfect in holiness and righteousness and justice and love. And we see God as some, something much, much less than he is. And in a sense, we see God as less than us. And God's not looking out for me. I need to. God kind of knows what he's talking about. But maybe not in this situation. I think I can lead myself. So oftentimes when we venture into sin, we, we've underestimated the destructiveness of sin and the nature and the character of our perfect and holy God who's given his son that we might find true life in him. The thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It's true of you. It's true for your kids. It's true in your marriage. It's true in your business dealings. It's true in every facet of life that Satan would wish to bring destruction. But Jesus, in those very same scenarios, wants to give us fullness of life. To those two foundational misunderstandings, sin's not that big of a deal, right? And, and God's really not all that wise. He's not all that powerful. He's not all that good. I would want to say that sin always leads to destruction, but obedience to God will always lead us to life. In Romans chapter 6, there's this, it's kind of an interesting, interesting discussion. What, what we know is that Jesus died on the cross to, to, to make an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He bore the wrath of God that you and I deserved. And we come to that, not because we were good enough, not because we somehow deserve it. We come to that by the grace of God alone. We have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, a common objection to that is like, 
hold on, you mean I'm just saved by grace? I don't have to do anything to earn that or to maintain that, and God's not going to like boot me out if I sin again? I would say, no, every sin you will ever commit was in the future when Jesus died on the cross. Like God knew it all, and still he chose to send Jesus to die on your behalf. So this objection comes. Well, doesn't that mean that people are just going to go live however they want? If Jesus has already made an atoning sacrifice for their sins, if the debt is paid, if the deal is done, if the debt has been canceled, can't we just live however we want? Paul picks up that exact line of questioning or reasoning in Romans chapter 6. He says, what shall we say then? Given this radical grace of God, this overwhelming love that's died for us, even though we were in profound sin and rebellion against God, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? He uses a really, really strong phrase in the Greek. It's it's hard to translate. It's the Greek, meganoito. It means may it never be. Like, put that thought away from you. Like, don't even think of that. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? You see, the, the act of justification... Like, justification wasn't the only facet of what Jesus did for us, where we've been reconciled to God. That's not the only thing that happened there on the cross. Our sins have merely been taken away. Something more profound happened. Ephesians chapter 2, we were, before Jesus died for us, before we came to faith in Christ, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But, he says, we have been made alive together with Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, like you have come to understand and believe the gospel, you are not who you once were. It says that you are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has gone and the new has come. And so Paul uh, asked the question here, should we just continue in sin then? He says, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And then he's going to give us this example of baptism of all things. I want to be really clear. Baptism doesn't wash away your sins. Like, it's not true. Baptism doesn't save you. It doesn't wash away your sins. But Paul's going to tell you what actually happens in baptism. Verse 3, he says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death? And you're like, wait a minute. I didn't know I was baptized into his death. What what is all all of this? He's going to explain. He says, therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Did you know that not only did Jesus Christ make you alive, in terms of we were dead in trespasses and sins, Jesus Christ made us alive together with him, there was also a death that took place. When you came to faith in Jesus Christ, you became a new creation. That old you, the one who's shouldering that guilt and that shame, who wants to think that you are still what you once were, you're a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, you are new in Christ Jesus. Before, you were a slave to sin. Slaves do what their masters tell them to. Before, you were only going to sin. But as a result of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, now you can live this, sin, or this sinless life that Jesus Christ lived. We are now free to walk in righteousness and not just in sin anymore. And so baptism, it's not washing our sins away like the water's not that special. Like don't pay the guy on TV for his water, okay? It's not going to wash your sins away. It's a symbol of what really happens to us when we come to faith in Christ. The old man dies. You've now been made new, raised up out of that water in newness of life to no longer live according to the way you used to live, but now in the victory and the freedom that Jesus Christ has given us, not just over the grave and death one day, but also over sin today. Like, that's the work of God for you. It didn't end that one day you got a ticket to heaven. And he wants to give you life today, a new life, living as a new creation right here and right now. Now, you might be here and be, be beaten down by sin. You're like, I know I've trusted in Jesus Christ. I've come to faith in him. But man, I 
falling off the ledge again. And it sure feels like slavery right now. And I, I've been walking in this and I can't seem to beat it. Like I don't, I don't know how to overcome this. Today I want to give you three ways to make war against that sin in your life. As believers in Jesus Christ, uh, we have our flesh. It's still here, right? Because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we now have a spirit, like our spirit's alive together with Christ, the Holy Spirit's in us. But we also have our fleshly nature. And in almost every single circumstance, your flesh is going to tell you what it wants to do. Like, you don't have to wonder, like, where is sin? We don't have to wonder where we're tempted toward. But because we now have Christ Jesus through his spirit in us, we now have the opportunity to hear not just the voice of our flesh, but the voice of the spirit and walk, not sowing seeds of destruction, but sowing seeds of life in us. And so today I want to give you just three tools that God has given us to make war against sin. And the reason I say make war is sin is not like a, a guest to be entertained in our houses. It's not something to kind of flirt with and play with. Uh, sin is more like cancer. You kill it, or it'll kill you. It always grows. It always spreads. It's not something that we would ever want to keep around. It's not something that we take lightly. Sin is something we have to make war against. We have to put to death in our life. And so I want to give you three tools to help us make war against sin. Number one, it's the Word of God. It's the revelation of God that He's given us to, to where we might know Him and we might understand in the midst of a world that's super confused about what is and is not true, about what is and is not right, about what is and is not holy, we've been given the Word of God to teach us to help us to be able to draw the lines that we might know the truth and might ultimately set us free. We've been given the word of God. The enemy is the deceiver that's going to ask you that same question in your life. That's really, it's, it's constant in our culture. Did God really say that's sin? Did God really say that gossip is destructive? Did God really say that I shouldn't think these thoughts? Did God really say that that's the world we live in? For almost every one of those things, God has given us his word, the truth that we might stand on this, that we might know the path that leads to life from the path that leads to destruction. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is inspired of God, literally breathed out by God. We can trust scripture because it came from God who's perfect. Like he didn't make mistakes when he gave us his word. He's perfect in all of his ways. And so we look to the scriptures inspired or breathed out by God, and it's beneficial for us, for teaching, for rebuke, for correcting, and for training us in righteousness. As men and women who claim to follow Jesus Christ, we've got to know the word. Like, we've got to be in it. Uh, I listened to a pastor several weeks ago, and he said, like, one of the most pervasive lies that he hears within the church today are men and women who claim to follow Jesus Christ who say, listen, I don't, I don't read. I can't read the Bible. I don't understand it. And it's a profound lie. In your flesh, it may be true of you. In that old man, it may be true that you couldn't look into the Word and you couldn't know what it says, but you have the Holy Spirit of God within you that illuminates the Scriptures. And so if you can read the stats on the sports page, if you can read on social media or the articles that you love, you can read and understand the Word of God. This is one of the tools that God has given us to lead us into life. It's not something to be avoided. It's something to be pursued with our whole hearts that we might know the word of God. That in the midst of confusion, in the midst of deception, we can know the truth. And so, man, I just want to call you out like very specifically today. Like, study the word and carry it with you. Spend more time in the scriptures than you do looking at your phone. More time in the scriptures than you spend watching Sports Center. This... These words were breathed out by God to us. And it's through the word of God that we begin to make war against sin. We know what is sin and what's not. We've been called to lead our families. And over and over and over, man, well, I don't read. Why not? Like start, like today's the day. Like get after, begin to read the word of God. This is sowing seeds of life into your family, into your own heart. They're going to grow up. They're going to bear fruit. We've been given the Word of God 
to make war against sin. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. The psalmist says, like, even the law, this is David, the law, it's like honey on his lips. The word is good, and we can trust it. The second thing that God has given us, the word of God, the second thing is the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now lives in you. And Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. The Spirit of God now lives within you. And it's through communing with the Spirit, walking by that Spirit, that we have victory over sin. You now have the ability. You're not a slave to sin anymore. Even Paul would say, we're slaves to righteousness through the Holy Spirit. John 15, 5, Jesus is speaking. He said, I'm the vine. You're just a branch. You want your life to bear a lot of fruit? Remain connected to me. Listen, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. He's here. We get to commune with the Spirit, walking by the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16, walk by the Spirit and you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. If we're going to have victory over sin, we can't keep walking in the flesh, but instead we yield ourselves to the Spirit of God who is in you, which means in present in you at every single moment, like the really great moments and the most tempting, difficult moments you'll walk through, you have within you love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and every bit of the fruit of the Spirit. It's already there. You've just got to walk in what God has already given you through the power of His Spirit. So He's given us the Word of God, the Spirit of God. And the final thing, God has given us the people of God. If we're going to make war against sin, God never intended for us to do this alone. There are about 37 commandments that Jesus gave us in the New Testament that you could never fulfill in isolation. Love one another. Serve one another. Bear with one another. All of these one another's of Scripture that can only be fulfilled in community with other believers. I, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, most of those could never be fulfilled right here while we sit in this room. If you're here today, I, I want you to know I'm really glad that you come and that you're here and you're, you're like participating in the corporate worship gathering. But this isn't all church is. Like this isn't like check the box and I've done my church deal for the week. You need to be walking in community with other believers and God ordained that. That we don't flip the Christian switch off when we walk out of here. But instead, we continue to walk with other believers, encouraging one another, spurring one another on toward love and toward good deeds. Last week, when Dustin stood up here, he talked about this verse. It's one of those one another's that you can never fulfill by yourself. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other. Why do we have to confess to each other? And why do I have to have other people pray for me? Can't I confess to God? Sure you can. And God is faithful and just and will forgive you. However, if you want to ultimately be healed from sin, which is what the rest of the verse says, we confess to one another and pray for each other that we may be healed. God has ordained that the prayer of a righteous person, when it is brought about, that it would accomplish much in your life. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Most of us have grown up in, in a, a day where, where churches, um, you came and you put on a pretty face, right? You dressed up in your nicest clothes, you put on your prettiest face, and for an hour or so, you smile, you shake hands, everybody's fine. Perhaps the most neglected thing I have seen in the church in my lifetime is this command for the church to confess to one another. And I grew up with a profound amount of shame in my life, and I had no idea that it was okay for me to be like, hey, here's where I'm really struggling, because everybody seemed to be fine in the church. I want you to know that this is a church where it's okay to not be okay. Like, we can admit to ourselves that we struggle, that we fail, that we need one another, that we can come to each other and say, listen, I'm struggling, I'm being tempted, would you pray for me that I might be healed? God has given us his word. And he's given us a spirit. And he's given us other people. And we won't have to walk through life sowing more seeds of destruction. But instead, that we could walk this path of life sowing seeds that are going to grow up and bear fruit in our lives. That our families for generations can be blessed because of the seeds that we've sown. 
Because we gave them an example of what it looks like to follow after Jesus rather than just kind of settling for being beaten and battered by the enemy in this world. And we walk this path of righteousness that leads to life. So today, before I finish, I just want to take one second and ask you to begin to think for yourself. What is that sin that you've been entertaining? What's the one that you've been convincing yourself, hey, it's really not that big of a deal? What is that sin that you've somehow convinced yourself that it's going to be better for you than walking the path to life that Jesus Christ has laid out for you? Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe it's the things that you're looking at when no one's watching. Maybe it's the little white lies. Maybe it's the way you're handling your finances. It's just a little bit dishonest. I'm going to ask that you would bow with me right now. And just ask, Father, that as we sit here today before you, we know that your spirit is inviting us to life. Lord, as we're here today as the gathered body of Christ, we pray that you would just reveal, put your finger on those sins. Or we've been believing the lie that somehow that's better for us than what you have for us. The ones that we've been cultivating in our life, the things we've been keeping around, the thing that needs to be put to death. Father, I pray that in these next few moments, you would lead our hearts to repentance. God, that's your kindness to us. Lord, I pray that we would be free to confess that this wouldn't be a place where people pretend. It would be a place where we confess and pray that healing might take place in this room. Father, may you have your way in our midst. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.